This is our Sunday School lesson for February the 11th from our Standard Lesson Commentary. And it is titled, A Disciplined Faith. This is Lesson 11 from Unit 3, entitled, Self-Control, Upright, and Godly Faith. And our background scripture uh, for our lesson is James 3, 1 through 12. Our devotional reading is Psalms 34, verses 1 through 14. And our printed text is James 3, verses 1 through 12. And our key verse is James 3, verses 8. Now, the aims of our lesson is to list James' metaphors about speech. Explain one or more of those metaphors in mm -hmm. light of a personal experience. And then identify a specific problem in our life regarding harmful speech. Now, the beginning of our lesson here, and uh, this lesson uh, kind of gets right to the core of us as individuals, but then collectively uh, together in the same sense. Uh, but I found the introduction into our lesson to uh, really um, spark uh, an interest into how this lack of control or the desire to gain control as our lesson is entitled, A Disciplined Faith, Self-Control. It's in, uh, somewhat interesting to uh, listen to uh, some of the thoughts that have been generated relative to uh, us being able to control our speech, our thought. Um, and that is that it's been associated with that uh, it's a part of our character, it's in our chemistry, uh, it's our school of thought, that it's kind of a battle between nurture and nature, uh, a part of our environment, also hereditary, that uh, we have these uh, conflicting issues going on here, which basically have been attributed to us explaining why I can't get my act together. Uh, you know, it's just, it's genetically a part of me. Uh, it's in my makeup. Uh, my mom, my dad uh, was like this. Uh, you know, I inherited this uh, behavior, this demeanor, this attitude. Well, uh, also, you know, it's all around me. It's in the environment. It's in our atmosphere. You know, it's cultivated a part of our culture. Um, you know, we attribute all of these excuses to why it is that I just can, you know, control my mouth. You know, I just, I just can't help myself. Uh, you know, uh, I'm quick to, you know, respond. I'm quick to speak. You know, I speak before I think. Uh, we identify what we should do while we're making our excuses. You know, we say, well, you know, I just blurt out whatever comes to my mind front, you know, first. You know, I, I always speak before I think. Well, therein lies the problem. Uh, let us look, though, at uh, how James is entering into this discussion and how uh, he uses these metaphors, these examples, uh, to try and give us better understanding of how we actually can move forward in trying to maintain 
and develop discipline, develop uh, control, develop a certain formula for how we improve ourselves rather than uh, convince ourselves that we are just duped into the current state that we find ourselves in. And it is just, that's just the way it is. No, that's not just the way it is. When we consider who our maker is and what our maker put in us to enable us to get above and beyond these man-made and self-made obstacles and hurdles that are placed in our journey, but they're not there as roadblocks. They're just there as forks and U-turns and new roadways that are a part of this journey. They're not there as deterrents. They're there as building blocks for us to overcome, but not to be stumbled and susceptible to. Now, our, our text, our lesson, starts out with a very interesting introduction because it says that not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, that's a, a quite a large yet uh, somewhat condensed by its directness. And it, it tells us that all of us can't be teachers, that we can all be followers, we can all be believers, but all of us can't be teachers because along with the teaching comes a expectation and also brings with it a responsibility. And what it explains to us is, is that those who have been charged or who have been called to be teachers, that there is a certain higher expectation for them and they will be judged more strictly. Now, I, I want us to somewhat indulge our, our thinking into this responsibility that's lifted here, but it's not generally, it is not just focused on the teacher, but it is what the expectations and the uh, responsibility that has been charged to this position because of what was expected to come out of the outpouring of this person who has been given the responsibility of bringing understanding to those that would hear. So to do that, I want us to uh, take a minute and just go to Ephesians 4 and the uh, 11th verse. Ephesians 4 and the 11th verse um, here gives us a better understanding of who the head of the church, the head of the body, what the expectations and also what was the planning of the head of the church. Here it says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Why did he do this? Was he trying to make big shots or big heads out of individuals? Was he just trying to uh, replace those who had already uh, uh, assigned themselves positions to lord over 
the masses of people? Was he just trying to uh, re reinvent the wheel and just, okay, now you had that servant, now I'm going to give you this, I mean, sorry, you had that master, now I'm going to give you this master. You were under that overseer, now I'm going to give you this overseer. Better yet, the intention was to provide for us servants, which is above any other title that can be given to man or woman is that of a servant. But let's look at uh, what Christ's intentions were. After he identified those positions that he gave to the church, then he says, uh, the reason I did this was to equip the people for works of service. Uh, in the King James, it says it was for the perfecting of the saints for work of service so that the body might be built up. So the whole intention was not just to create many me's. It was not just to uh, uh, create uh, people that would be uh, arrogant and, and stuck on themselves. But the purpose was for equipping the saints, perfecting them for the works of service so that the entire body might be built up. And then it says, until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and that we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, when we begin to talk about the lack of the use of the tongue, that uh, sometimes in, in our greatest effort, uh, the use of the words that we use, uh, how those are sometimes offensive, although it may not be our intention. This is why that in the process of uh, delivering a message or teaching a lesson or uh, engaging in a discussion, uh, there must always be the preference of uh, making certain that the tone in which we teach, that it is wholesome, that it is inviting, that it's not offensive and intimidating, but that the purpose of it is to bring enlightenment uh, and understanding to those who are under the sound of the voice. Uh, it Now, as it moves from talking about the responsibility and the expectations of teachers, and it says that any teacher who assumes that they are never at fault in what they say, uh, that they, they consider themselves to be perfect, uh, that uh, they are able, they have the discipline, uh, they have the control to keep their whole body in check. Uh, of course, uh, we only know of one individual who reached or uh, established that attainment, and that was Christ, the Son of God. Uh, that still becomes a work in progress for the rest of us. So because of that, uh, uh, the verse goes forward. Uh, it identifies that we stumble in many ways. And, and one of the ways that we stumble is for those who think that they are never at fault and that what they say is perfect and they, they got everything under control. Well, that's one of the ways that we stumble. But then... James gives us these metaphors, and it talks about how something very small controls something very large. So he gives us the example of the bridle, that uh, metal 
device that is placed in the mouth of a horse. And then he talks about the rudder on a ship and how something very tiny, something small is able to control a very large and massive body. Now here, uh, we, we are able to understand that the tongue is a small part of the body, of the body but it, it can create a massive destruction. Uh, that we consider that uh, the tongue is like an uncontrolled fire and it sets out little sparks and although the spark is small, it creates a massive forest fire. And we recognize that we in past, sometimes unfortunately in present, hopefully, prayerfully, not in the future, but have damaged, caused a lot of damage just by the improper use of our tongue. So, but what James does is use these metaphors to explain to us that, you know, uh, we control large animals with just a little small metal piece placed in their mouth. And by tugging on that one way or another, we can direct that large animal to go here to the right or go here to the left or to slow down or to continue in your pace by that little small tug. And a lot of times we like to attribute the tongue almost as though it is some uh, separate, independent entity. Like it, it has its own uh, operatives. You know, like it's, it's something that is absent from the body. You know, I just can't control it. It just does and says what it wants to. No, it's actually a part of us. And there is a control. You know, a lot of times we say, if I would have just followed my first mind. You know, sometimes um, we disregard what the Spirit tells us and says to us that we ought to do. And then we listen to that other voice. And so even though the Spirit gives us utterance, we sometimes disregard that for the acceptance of our own utterance. So it's not what the Spirit said we should have said. We gave them what we desired to say. We gave them a piece, as it were, of our own mind. So um, we first have to recognize that the tongue is not some independent, separate entity. It's a part of us. It's a part of the body. And it can be controlled, but it does require discipline to maintain that. So look at the damage that it causes when it's out of control compared to the good works that are performed when it's under control. Now, when we start talking about control, uh, because the lesson gives uh, the metaphors about the fires, the forest fires that we start, how we damage people's lives with the evil that we speak, how, you know, the tongue is an evil, restless part of the body. It spews out deadly poison. Uh, we, we recognize uh, these factors uh, that are unfortunate even for us to identify. But I want us to look at how we control it because the lesson is focused on self-control, on discipline. Uh, to entertain this, I wanted us to go to the scripture so that we can see how we've already been empowered. Let's go to the sixth chapter of Romans 
and then the uh, 15th verse. Because at the beginning of our lesson, it talked about, you know, us using the excuse about, you know, it's genetically uh, inherited, you know, uh, it's, it's in my chemistry and so forth and so on, you know, it's a part of uh, the nurturement, uh, the nourishment and uh, the battle between nature and such. Uh, but I want us to see what the scriptures say. Um, since we rely so much on what's going on in the outer world, uh, outside of us, we put all of our attention and our focus on uh, the influence and, you know, our peers and, you know, everybody's this, that and the other. And, you know, I just can't help myself. Well, l let's look at what scripture says. It says, in Romans, the sixth chapter and the 15th verse, it says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or if you submit yourself to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, right here, I want to pause because a lot of times uh, it's what we expose ourselves to. If we're sitting around watching these crazy so-called reality shows, which are nothing near reality at all, at best is just actuality. See, actuality is what something is. Reality is what something becomes once it recognizes its potential. So when we look at these crazy talk shows and reality shows and look at the uh, uh, inference on commercials and, and uh, all of the uh, things we have through social media, we have a rising uh, number of suicides and violent, brutal acts taking place today among our young people through social media, through texting and Facebooking and through emails and through Twitter and on and on and on. And a lot of this is simply because of what we are exposing ourselves to. And this is why it says, don't you know that what you offer yourselves to that you allow that element now to become your master, your ruler, and that now that that is your teacher, that now your lesson is, is you begin to practice the things that you have allowed yourself to become influenced by and overwhelmed and overtaken by. But just like you will uh, perform the acts of that inference, if we would yield ourselves to constructive, positive, to things that are creative, not destructive or negative, but to things that are positive, that then we would also begin to fulfill the righteousness, the constructiveness, the creative things, the positive things. Because now we have another teacher. So if we would look at ourselves and ch just pay attention to what we yield ourselves to. Now, I'm going to close with this here. Because it says that, and this is in the 18th verse, uh, still Romans 6, now I'm at verse 18. It says, you have been set free from sin 
and have become slaves, servants to righteousness. It goes on and it says in 19, I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as servants to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as servants to righteousness leading to holiness. Now catch this part here. It says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. You remember when you said whatever you wanted to say, you did whatever you wanted to do, you went wherever you wanted to go. Let me include myself in that. You remember when we said whatever we wanted to say, we did whatever we wanted to do, we went wherever we wanted to go. You know, there were still people that were trying to tell us that we were on the wrong path, saying the wrong things, doing the wrong things. But, you know, we were in control. And at that point, we were able to perform all types of wicked and, and unprofitable deeds and acts. Uh, but we had no inference or no influence of righteousness at that time. Well, just like we had the ability and the control to do wicked acts or to perform deeds of sin or mischief or misconduct, just like we had the power and self-control to do that, guess what? We have the same power and the same self-control to do otherwise. So... As we look at the closing of our uh, lesson where it talks about, you know, can uh, a fig tree bear olives? Can a grapevine bear figs? Uh, can salt, uh, can, uh, neither can salt spring from fresh water? You know, if we are truly the called of our creator, of our maker, then we need to be what the maker created us to be. So we always say, you can judge the tree by the fruit that it bears. God bless you and God keep you. And we hope that something that we said has brought some understanding and better yet has equipped us on this journey that we are all on together, trying to make heaven our home. God bless you.